Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There is no other God in heaven or on earth, no other rock on which we can build our lives. Our true strength is found in God alone. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship Almighty God. Um, announcements. Please remember to bring your shoeboxes in next Sunday. Uh, that will be the end of the collection time. It actually begins tomorrow, but next Sunday I will bring the bag, the boxes, to a church that's very near me. Um, and there are boxes and labels outside if you have not gotten them. And this morning, Gail just taught me how to use the QR code so that you can trace your box and make the payment for helping to mail the boxes online. Gee, hmm. who knew? And Gail, I know, was saying, and I was showing her. <laughs> no. Oh my, yes. Uh, are there any other? Uh, yes. Another thing to bring next week would be your pledge cards. Um, you can put them in the envelope, in the offering plates during the collection. And if you have them today, by all means. Are there any other announcements? Then let's turn in our bulletin to our responsive call to worship. It is from 1 Samuel, the second chapter, selected verses. Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There, there is, is no one, one holy like, like the Lord. There, there is, is no one besides you. There, there is, is no rock like, like our God. God. Do, Do not, not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He will guard the feet of his saints. But the wicked will be silenced in darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder against them from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Let us join in our hymn of praise. Come, ye thankful people, come. If you're able, let us stand.
place been seated? Let us turn in our bulletins to our unison prayer of invocation and confession. And let us pray together, saying, God of all knowledge, Hannah's prayer resonates across the ages and in our hearts. We praise you, our rock and our redeemer. We worship you with awe and wonder, knowing there is no holy one like you. May our worship and the service of our lives give you the glory you deserve. As the colors of fall fade and the empty branches point heavenward, we confess we have limited your access to transform our personal landscapes. Forgive us, Lord. Jesus, our great high priest, gave us two commandments, to love you, O God, and love our neighbor. Forgive us, O God, when we allow doubts, misgivings, or fears to interfere with our love for you. Forgive us, Lord, when we allow frustrations, irritations, or imperfections to impede our love for our neighbors. Transform our hearts and minds, and hear us now as we lift our personal confessions in silence. When Christ had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Receive <coughs> the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson comes from 
1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. When, they came, when the day came from El Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah and her husband would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered. <coughs> Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went on her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. Our Episcopal lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14 and 19 through 25. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which should never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for his sin, for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to, make, to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another in all the more as you see the day approaching. Our gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? 
Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, will these things, tell us when these things will happen, and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing and understanding of God's holy word. <clears throat> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. What have you asked the Lord for, and God has answered your prayer? The Old and New Testament lessons proclaim God's faithfulness. Hannah prayed to God that he would see her misery and allow her to conceive. And the Lord remembered Hannah. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, which means asked of God, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. He who promised is faithful. 20th century American evangelist and author of the book, The Cross and the Switchblade, David Wilkerson said, our faith is not meant to get us out of a hard place or change a painful condition. Rather, it is meant to reveal God's faithfulness to us in the midst of our dire situation. The author of Hebrews emphasized the superiority of Christ over all the Old Testament practices and rituals, especially the sacrificial system. The priesthood of the Levites under the Old Covenant required repeated sacrifice day after day, year after year. First for the priest, then for the people, offering animals daily to atone for sin. But those sacrifices could never fully remove sin because they did not change the heart. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The author of Hebrews compared the work of the Levite priests to the superior work of Jesus. The Levitical high priest always stood because his work was never finished. Jesus, one sacrifice for all, himself, for all time, forgave all sin. No other sacrifice is necessary. Jesus' sacrifice was not only sufficient, but effective, because by one sacrifice, Jesus made perfect forever those who are being made holy, you and me. Jesus' priesthood is superior 
to the Levite's priesthood. He who promised is faithful. It is said that Cyrus, the founder of the Persian Empire, captured a prince and his family. When they came before him, Cyrus asked the prisoner prince, what will you give me if I release you? Half of my wealth, he replied, and if I release your children, everything I possess. And if I release your wife, your majesty, I will give myself. Cyrus was so moved by the prince's devotion that he freed them all. As they returned home, the prince said to his wife, wasn't Cyrus a handsome man? With a look of deep love for her husband, she said to him, I didn't notice. I could only keep my eyes on you the one who was willing to give himself for me. By his one sacrifice, Jesus has fully accomplished what the law could not. Jesus made a way for us to be made perfect, to be made holy in God's sight not in this life. At least, not me. Maybe you. Thank you, Jesus. Because of Jesus' willing sacrifice on the cross, we now have direct access to God. We gain this access not on our merit, but on God's free grace, his unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor through our faith in Jesus' death on the cross. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have confidence to enter the most holy place. That's where the presence of God was. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain that is his body. In what? Do we have confidence? Jesus' blood shed for us? 20th century American theologian and congregational pastor Donald Blush wrote, Our peace and confidence are to be found not in our empirical holiness, not in our progress toward perfection, but in the alien righteousness of Jesus Christ that covers our sinfulness and alone makes us acceptable before a holy God. In 1830, George Wilson was convicted of robbing the U.S. mail in Pennsylvania and was sentenced to be hanged. President Andrew Jackson issued a pardon for Wilson, but Wilson refused to accept it. The matter went to Chief Justice John Marshall, who wrote, a pardon is a piece of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. 2,000 years ago, God issued a pardon to all who claim faith in Jesus based on his death on the cross. But as in the case of George Wilson, the value of the pardon is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. We have a permanent forgiveness in Christ when we accept our pardon through Jesus, our Savior. God's grace 
is not contingent upon our performance, but on the promised faithful work of Jesus on the cross. He who promised is faithful. Because of our confidence in Jesus' death on the cross, gaining us access to God, the author of Hebrews gives us five exhortations that come from Jesus providing our reconciliation with God. Let us draw near to God. Two, let us hold unswervingly to hope. Three, let us consider how we may spur one another on. Four, let us not give up meeting together. Five, let us encourage one another. I got him. <laughs> Sorry, Lord, he's one of your creatures, but he's very irritating. Four characteristics embody those who draw near to God. A sincere, meaning genuine, real, true, trustworthy heart. An undivided heart, committed to God. Two, in full assurance, meaning complete or fullness that faith brings. Trusting in the cross of Christ. We measure our faith against the truth of the cross. Three, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty, literally sick, bad, or evil conscience. Freedom from a sense of guilt comes from the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. But maybe if you were raised with a parent who was good at giving guilt trips, it's a little harder to find that freedom that Christ gives. Trust the cross. And four, having our bodies washed with pure water. We are cleansed from sin through the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross. Do we draw near to God when life is easy? What about when life is hard? Acts 17 tells us, God is not far from each of us. Let us draw near to God. In his book, Your Father Loves You, J.I. Packer wrote, Grace is God drawing sinners closer and closer to him. How does God in grace prosecute this purpose? Not by shielding us from assault by the world, the flesh, and the devil, nor by protecting us from burdensome and frustrating circumstances. Not yet by shielding us from troubles created by our own temperament and, per and psychology, mm -hmm. but rather by exposing us to all these things so as to overwhelm us with a sense of our own inadequacy and to drive us to cling to God more closely. God takes steps to drive us, us out of self-confidence so we trust in God. Let us draw near to God. The second exhortation, let us hold unswervingly, unyieldingly to the hope we profess or confess. For he who promised is faithful. <clears throat> Perseverance verifies our hope. God, in whom we hope, is faithful. That is trustworthy, dependable, believable. Circumstance will always try to dictate doubt and unbelief every time. Faith 
isn't swayed by circumstances. However, circumstances are always swayed by faith in God's abilities and promises. We can find hope in our darkest hour because God is faithful. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. The third exhortation, let us consider how we may spur one another on, meaning stir up ardent incitement toward love and good deeds. A 19th century American textbook called McGuffey's Readers used poetry to enrich language while imparting ethical and moral lessons. Hear these words. Beautiful hands are they that do deeds that are noble, good, and true. Beautiful feet are they that go swiftly to lighten another's woe. The value of good deeds lies in the love that inspires it. Let us consider how we may spur one another, one another on toward love and good deeds. The fourth exhortation, let us not give up meeting, meaning abandon, leave behind, or forsake meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. An older woman was amazed at how nice the young man living next door was. Every day, he would help her gather her things from her car or help her in her yard. One day, the woman asked the young man, son, how did you become such a fine young man? The young man replied, when I was a boy, I had a drug problem. The woman expressed shock. I can't believe that. The young man said, it's true. My parents drug me to church on Sunday mornings, <laughs> drug me to church on Sunday nights, and drug me to church on Wednesday evenings. Do you have a drug problem, son? <laughs> right, Grandpa? Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. The fifth exhortation, but let us encourage one another. Robert Schuller of California's Crystal Cathedral told this story. A banker always tossed a coin in the cup of a double-leg amputee beggar who sat on the street outside his bank. But unlike most people, the banker would always insist on getting one of the pencils the man had beside him. You are a merchant, the banker would say, and I always expect to receive good value from the merchants I do business with. One day, the beggar was not on the sidewalk. Time passed, and the banker forgot about him until he walked into a public square, and there in the concession stand sat the former beggar. He was obviously well, doing well at this concession stand. I've always hoped you might come by someday, the man said. You are largely responsible for me being here. You kept telling me that I was a merchant, so I started thinking of myself that way instead of as a beggar receiving gifts. I started selling pencils, lots of them, you encouraged me and gave me self-respect, caused me to look at myself differently. Who could you encourage today, tomorrow, or the next day? It could make all the difference. Let us encourage one another. 
Holocaust survivor Corey Ten Boom wrote, in God's faithfulness lies eternal security. In God's faithfulness lies eternal security. When we follow the exhortations in Hebrews 10, we learn and reinforce the truth that keeps us moving forward, maturing in our faith, and rejoicing in Christ our Savior. That truth, he who promised is faithful. Amen. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. As we continue in a spirit of worship, let us offer our financial gifts to God. The usher will receive the morning offering. turn to God in prayer. God of every beginning and end, teach our world to treasure all our time on this earth as given by you. Give us vision to see other nations as children created in your image. Give us hope to believe that you can and will bring peace to warring places like Ukraine and Russia, Israel, Gaza and Lebanon, Syria, Afghanistan and Sudan. Give all who seek power over others a wake-up call so our world does not descend into greater conflict. God of every beginning, Teach this nation to treasure all our time on this earth as given by you. Give our elected and newly elected and appointed officials the wisdom to govern and evaluate wisely, especially President Biden, Vice President Harris, President-elect Trump, all 100 senators, 435 representatives, 50 governors, 5 U.S. territorial governors, and every judge. May those who aren't happy with the results of the election 
not work against newly elected officials, but work with them, that the true blessing of our democratic republic might become evident to all. Protect the men and women serving this country, here, overseas, and at our borders. God of every beginning and end, teach our neighbors near and far, those in need, to treasure all their time on this earth as given by you. To those struggling to make ends meet, give hope. To those sick, suffering, grieving, or dying, dying, give comfort and healing. To those manipulated, abused, exploited, or addicted, give relief and freedom. To the unjustly accused or incarcerated, and those who guard, provide meals, health care, or legal or emotional counseling, give new vision. God of every beginning and end, teach your church to treasure all our time on this earth as given by you. Give all who call on the name of Jesus hope in life eternal. Give all who call Grace Church their spiritual home, deeper faith, and greater love for all. Give to pastors, denominational leaders, and all your people greater love that others will see the life of Christ in us and be drawn to your circle of love. God of every beginning and end, teach our extended family of faith to treasure all our time on this earth as given by you. May our young couples, individuals, and families remember we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. May our couples and those they love remember, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we prefer for he who promised is faithful. May each one gathered here and those unable to be among us remember whenever difficulties happen, in bitterness of soul Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord and you answered. O key, Nicholas, Anthony, Matthew, David, Susan, David, Anna, Karen, Gail, Gary, Betsy, Joanne, Karen, and Mark. Lord, lay your healing hand upon him. David, Ed, Ava. David's friend, Amelia. Gary N, Sandy J, Muriel, Babs, Chris F, Cliff, Penny, Julius, Caroline, Tina, Anthony, Regent, Todd G, Matthew. Help those we know and care about who are struggling or just trying to move forward. Pray like Hannah. O oh Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, not forget your servant. Karen Kay's friend, Eric, Betsy's granddaughter, Portia, and their baby, Upton Michael, Matthew's friend, Rye, Nicholas's friend, Oliver, Joanne's daughter, and, uh, and, and daughter, Andrea, and fiance, Adam, son, Thomas, and Christy, grandchildren, Lucas, twins, Oliver and Eve, Nephews Michael and Sean, Sister Diane, Joe and Gail, now in Florida, their daughter Inger. May they find a, a home, a permanent place that they come to love as they love their home here in Farmington. Jeff and Luella, their family, DJ, Megan, granddaughter Kate, Karen R. 
Mark's friends Faith and Dan, Victor and Lillian, sons Joel, Scott, and Neil. We thank you that Neil will be graduating in December. Give him strength for these last days of his last semester. Thank you, he already has a job. Karen Kay's friends, Linda M, Fran A, her daughter Kate, son James, and Christy, and grandson Henry. Muriel's friend, Eileen. Our missionaries, Adam, Janelle, and their children, Jonathan, Thomas, Elizabeth, and the new baby, Joseph. May those enduring life-threatening illnesses or grieving the loss of loved ones remember you answered Hannah's prayer. I am deeply troubled. I am pouring out my soul to the Lord. I am praying out of my great anguish and grief. Anna's friend, Ashley's cousin, who was murdered.
Let us join in our hymn of response, number 788, Now Thank We All Our God. If you're able, let us stand. Amen. Mm -hmm. 